we're in our doctor's office here at the Pioneer Heritage Center. And um, Pioneer Medicine is a long stretch from what it is today. Modern medicine, of course, you know, um, has just evolved over the, you know, a short amount of time. Whereas the Pioneer Medicine, it kind of stayed stagnant there for a while without a whole lot of um, changes. But, um, you know, it was still pretty archaic. Some of the things they were still doing um, early on in this area, they were still doing bloodletting. They were still using leeches. They were still, you know, doing things that, um, that you know, modern medicine kind of has frowned upon, but we know some of those have kind of come full circle as well. So, but you consider that the things that, that, that we take for granted today when we go to the doctor, um, things like um, the instruments being as germ-free as possible, or um, the doctor has washed his hands before he decides to work on us, the tools are sterilized, um, modern painkillers, anesthetics, a lot of these things were nowhere even on the radar yet for these doctors that were practicing. And we use the term loosely for doctors when we're talking early medicine. Um, a lot of these doctors in our region were uh, self-taught or they had worked under somebody else who had been self-taught and they were getting ready to retire. So um, they would just learn as they, as they went. This would be the room that you would come into for possibly a tooth pulling if they were going to take tonsils out, if they were going to remove an appendix, if they were going to deliver a baby, um, if you were going to do an eye exam. Um, you came to the one exam room that they had. Warmer weather, better days, people would sit outside and wait. Um, if it was cold and nasty, middle of winter, everybody could easily be crammed into the exam room with maybe just a sheet pulled across the patient. You know, privacy wasn't that huge of a uh, important thing for them to have to have when you went to the doctor. So um, other things that make it scary to come to the doctor during this pioneer time is, I mean, if you look at our exam table we have, the exam table is, it's all metal. So this is a metal exam table. Um, would they sterilize it? No. Would there be the clean paper like we would imagine at the doctor today when you go to the exam table? No. And of course, we have our, our mannequin on here, but under our mannequin, there actually is a groove bent into the center tray of the exam table, and that groove runs into a pan, which um, is basically called the blood pan and the blood groove. So if the doctor was doing work, say removing an appendix, the blood would run around the side of the patient under his back into that groove and then into the pan, and then the smaller pan would allow the blood to drip into the larger pan on the floor. Um, and then, of course, once the surgery was done, did they sterilize it? No. Bucket of water and a rag, they would wash it off, um, and that would be about as clean as they would get it. And the same for their tools. A good doctor would have, a, have something similar to this, a wash basin where they would have uh, the water for washing their hands and a basin for rinsing their hands and a bar of soap. The soap they used was not any kind of antibacterial soap. It was basically homemade lye soap, um, but it was better than nothing, so they would wash up if they could and then they would start to do um, their work. But think about there's no x-rays, there's nothing to render you unconscious for surgery, there's nothing to give you for pain, at least really what we would say really good painkillers, morphine had not been invented yet, um, ether had not been invented yet. So you think, you take our mannequin here and we'll say he was out breaking horses and he got thrown off a horse and he landed wrong and um, the unfortunate thing was when he landed, he actually maybe broke his leg. So his foot's pointed in the wrong direction. We know it's broken because it's pointed in the wrong direction. So we load him up in the wagon. They bring him into the doctor's office maybe five, seven miles on a rough, bumpy road with him bouncing around in the back of the buckboard. They get him to the doctor, and the doctor looks at him and gives him his best medical opinion. He goes, yes, it's broken. And the doctor says, okay, well, the first thing we have to do is we're gonna to have to try to get his boots off. Now our, our mannequin doesn't have his boots on, but they would have to remove the boots. So in order to do that, first thing you would have to do is rotate the leg back into the right position. So that would just entail the doctor just doing and rotating the leg back with him screaming and hollering the entire time. And something else the doctors would do that they don't do today is he would ask the, his buddies that brought him, I'm gonna need your help and their job would be to pin him to the table while the doctor did his work. So, you know, we'll say I was the, the person who brought him in, well, my job would be to do this and pin him to the table while the doctor rotated that foot back up into the upright position. So the doctor gets ready to take his boot off and 
He digs around in his bag and he may pull out just a, he may just pull his pocket knife out and go to cut the leather on the boot and he may moan and groan and ask the doc not to cut his boots off. Well, why not cut his boots off? Well, simple reason. It may be the only pair of shoes he had. So he would, the doctor would then have to make the decision, well, do I cut his boot off or do I go by his wishes? So he goes by his wishes, so the doctor with a broken leg inside the boot manages to wrestle the boot loose, and when he does, he hears a nice slurpy sound when, he, when the heel comes loose, and he hears it go, and when it does, basically he gets the boot off, the pants leg's all bloody, there's a bulge sticking out on the side, the boot's full of blood, and the reason for that is because the bone has been exposed through the skin. So the doctor does his best. Remember, no painkillers, no x-ray, and the doctor has to set, try to set this bone in the only way he knows how. So the first effort's going to be, he's going to take the heel and the foot, and he's going to apply pressure and pull and see if he can pull the bone back under the skin. Well, that works somewhat, but it doesn't work as well as it should. So then what is he going to do? He's going to grab the ankle and take his fingers and put pressure on that broken bone and push it back through the hole that it's made through the skin and then push his finger in there so he can feel the bones and he's going to rotate the bone and foot around until he thinks he feels those bones come back together. And at that point, he's going to bandage it up. No plaster cast at this time. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to splint it. And splinting it involves two boards. He would take two boards, one on each side of the leg, the wound would be bound, and he would take the two boards, lay them side by side on there, and then take some dressings and tightly wrap the board on, and that would become the cast. When they get him home, and within 10 days, maybe a little longer, the house starts getting this kind of foul odor to it. They notice there may be flies buzzing around the wound, um, and they fear, their biggest fear is that maybe it's got infected. And of course, an infection was not something you wanted to get um, on any major scale because with gangrene setting in, um, they didn't have any antibiotics to apply to it or to even give them orally to try to fight the infection. You had to hope that your body was strong enough to fight it off. If the infection set in, the cure-all for a major infection was amputation. So you bring him back to the doctor. The doctor goes, I was afraid it was going to happen. Um, that it would get infected. Why did it get infected? Well, the good reason could have been because the doctor had his fingers in the wound doing whatever he needed to do, but he had to do what he had to do in order to try to save the leg. Well, now the infection's there, and the doctor would have to come up above the infected area and remove the, the leg, and it would generally have, first amputation would be at the knee. So they would come in and maybe come up mid part of the thigh, and they would use something very crude and very um, what we would say very crude, but it would be an amputation kit, um, and the amputation kit would have um, everything needed to actually remove the limb, um, and most doctors would be pretty practiced in um, amputation, especially after the American Civil War, because they had just had hundreds of thousands of patients to work on, so amputation was, um, was the route to go. So they would take their amputation tools, and the first one that they would have to use would be the, the scalpel, and these are not nice and delicate tools, you can, as you can see. It's long, it's very narrow, it's got a very sharp edge on it. And the reason for the length is because this, would, this blade here would have to be pushed completely through the thigh, through the top and out the bottom. Then they would take the bone saw, and the bone saw has very small teeth on it, and it would be used to, um, just like it says, to saw through the bone. And they would saw the bone as close up to the top as they could. And what they would do is they would cut the bone higher than the flesh would be when they folded it back over. And they would fold that flesh back over the shortened bone and they would stitch that and that's what would make the stump. So you would think that a lot of patients would die with this type of surgery, but it was a very effective surgery done properly. You know, we talk about doctor's office now because we have a doctor's office here. But a lot of times, like I mentioned earlier, these doctors were tenant. Uh, farmers, so they farmed and they did, but they were also what was called saddlebag doctors. And saddlebag doctors were doctors that um, not only stayed homebound at their doctor's office, but they would go out and roam the countryside and go to these small communities. We have a great example 
of um, what these saddlebag doctors would carry. Not only would they have a saddlebag possibly with their amputation kit and their surgical kits in it and whatnot, but we have a great example here of a saddlebag doctor's kit um, that has all the medicines he would have had and needed at the time. And you see they're each individually hold, um, held by leather straps and whatnot. There's vials and there's also the bottles and the bottles lean out so the doctor can have, gain access to them. The top would have been areas where he would have kept spoons and maybe smaller portions of uh, medicines and whatnot. Um, and this would have all been closed up and carried by the doctor on horseback. And this would be his medical bag. A lot of the medicines during this time were based, um, had coca based, um, they were opium based. So sometimes they didn't really have true medical properties, it just made you feel real good that they were there. So, um, but locally, things that they would use um, for medicines, they would use things like dandelions, which was great for um, when you were constipated. They used willow bark. Um, you could boil the willow bark down and scrape the residue out of the pot, and uh, that's the basic ingredient for an aspirin. So it was a great, you know, early painkiller. Um, one of my favorites that they used was a tree called tickle tongue. And tickle tongue was what they would use prior to doing any dental work. You can suck on it and it'll make your mouth go numb. Um, now, as good as Novocaine? No, but it was better than nothing. We'll move here to the back, um, which was basically the doctor's dental office and also um, the pharmacy. There would be jars and vials of ground up um, powders and whatnot, and he would make his own pills and his own um, medicines that way. Um, and of course, like I said, they used things that would grow naturally. Um, some of them actually did have some medicinal purposes and actually worked. Some of them um, did not. A lot of these recipes, they didn't even call them prescriptions, that they used for medicines um, called for things that are poisonous. So there's recipes that call, believe it or not, that have um, requ require that you put three drops of hemlock in it. Hemlock is very poisonous. There's um, Several that recall that call for crushed up um, buckeye seeds. Well, buckeyes are poisonous. So the rule of thumb was a little could cure you and a lot could kill you. So the doctor would have had his pharmacy, um, his scales for weighing the, the powders and whatnot and measuring out everything into the way he would, have, he would have needed it. We mentioned this was also would have become the dentist's office as well. Dental work is probably, in my opinion, outside of surgery, one of the scariest things that people would have had to have done back during this time period. Um, if you look here, we have our, our dental chair and our dental drill. And our dental drill is what's referred to as a treadle drill. And a treadle drill is just that. It runs off a treadle like a treadle sewing machine. It would have had a series of belts and pulleys on it. Ours is missing a few pieces. But you would use foot power to get the belts turning. And you can hear it's nice and squeaky. So you can imagine that dental drill sound. And it would have that and that would go up. And then of course that would be what would cause the drill bit to turn and the dentist would use that to drill your teeth. Our dental chair that you see here is a true dental chair um, and medical chair that would have been used. Uh, this one was um, used in the circa around 1856 um, by a local doctor, Dr. G.A. Frierson, which was south of town here. And true blue medical chair, and the reason that we know that it's a true blue dentist and medical chair is number one, by its design um, and by its function. So we know if you foot pedal here, the chair can lean back, I mean, and you can get a lot of angle to the patient who's laying in the chair. But the big, the big thing is, is the absence of any arms built on this chair. Because in order for the doctor to be able to pull a tooth, he had to keep you as immobile as he could. So the patient would sit in the chair, back against the back, of course, and then the doctor himself would actually just step over the patient and pin him to the chair so he could work on the patient's mouth and basically keep his body from moving around so much. Um, pulling of teeth, just kind of like today, but not the, the, the Novocaine or anything that they would, they would give you. Um, pliers were used and put to, to remove an a impacted tooth. One of my favorite was a tool called a tooth key. And the tooth key consists of a handle, a shaft, and a hook. And it's a hinged hook. And we'll pretend that our fingertip is the end of the, is a tooth. 
and you would hang that at the base of the gum right under the edge of the tooth and rotate it around and then using just manpower and leverage you would rotate the tooth out of the gum line. We've all always hear about George Washington having wooden teeth. Well, and they weren't always wooden. Um, as the years would go by, um, eventually they would start making dentures and false teeth. And if we look, we have ivory teeth that would be used, or porcelain. Porcelain was used a lot too. Um, but the unique things about these um, dentures are that they are toxic because the base that they made and used, they used lead to hold these teeth in place. So you pop these in your mouth and your gums are fairly absorbent and they're pulling toxins out left and right. So you wear them for a few weeks and all of a sudden you start feeling kind of sickly. The doctor doesn't know about lead poisoning at the time. So he tells you, well, just stay off your feet for a few days and hopefully you'll get to feeling better. <coughs> so you're not gonna wear your dentures while you're in bed, so you set them on the table. You get to feeling better, you're back on your feet. So um, you put your teeth back in and then you get sick again. So, you know, you could get lead poisoning just from wearing your, your dentures at the time. You know, we, we, we talked about the doctors themselves. Um, regionally, when you look at this time period, the 1830s to the 1930s, um, if we go 1849, um, the records show that there were only 87 doctors in the western half of Louisiana. You know, that's pretty scarce when you talk about a, a populace, you know, a state, a whole state. So, you know, these doctors, like I said, we talked about them moving around. Um, these doctors were, were much needed, um, but, you know, I always tell the kids on our tours when we do our tours, you know, the next time you go to your doctor, be sure to hug his or her neck or shake his or her hand and tell them thank you just because of the amount of time they issued into their schooling and everything that they've done to help bring us into this modern world.